Welcome everybody to the free introductory class called Egyptian Mythology and the Exodus, which is basically Yitziat Mitzrayim. And I'll make sure to say everything in Hebrew and English at the same time. I'm going to use the Israeli pronunciation. So I'm going to say Yitziat Mitzrayim and Aserat HaMakot, not Aserat HaMakos in Yitziat Mitzrayim. But I speak that language too. That's how I grew up. I just want to make sure that everybody understands. And the whenever I, I quote things from the Torah, uh, from Tanakh, I'll show it in Hebrew, but I'll say it in English. So it's good for everyone. But I think it's better to see the original words. It helps a lot. So we're going to get right into it. Um, our topic today is in honor of Pesach, which is around the corner. It's uh, kind of hard to believe that Pesach is right around the corner. And what I want to do with you today in this, uh, basically the next hour, uh, is we're going to have a virtual tour and class where we're going to talk about the Egyptian mythology and the land of Egypt and the kings of Egypt. This is one of three classes that I do about this, so we can't cover everything. We're covering some of it, but it'll give you a taste of why it's important. Why is it important for us Jews to study the ancient history and mythology, which is basically made up stories uh, about the Egyptians and how they looked at the world and their gods and their story. Like, why do we need to know that? Right? I'm sitting here in the classroom and I'm learning the Chumash, the Chumash, the Torah, and I'm learning uh, the story of the miracles and God taking us out of Egypt and Moshe. Like, why do I need to know this stuff that we only know for about 150 years since we learned how to read hieroglyphics? And we'll get to that too. So I want to show you a, a taste of what you can add to your Seder, to your Sir Pesach, to your learning when you know these things. Uh, so that's basically the goal of what we're going to do. And I'm going to give you a bit of a background. Some of you might recognize this picture in the background. This is in New York City. It's the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, I have guided hundreds of tours. There are thousands of people, and I, I'm known as the museum guy, even though my name is Nachliel, but I'm known as the museum guy because I do tours for all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds in museums around the world with a focus on Tanakh, Torah, Jewish history, art, and all kinds of other things. So whether you're in Israel, you're coming for Pesach, I do tours here. I visit New York every once in a while and I do virtual tours around the world. And these are pictures from uh, my tours in New York, except for one that was taken last week in Jerusalem. And you'll have to figure out which one that is, I'm not telling you. All right, so without further ado, let's get into our story. Um, let's begin with Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, this is a picture in the Met, which is actually the, the woman who's posing as if she's Moshe's mother. And I'm adding the song, you may recognize Prince of Egypt. Uh, that's Miriam looking at Moshe who's in the basket. And in this picture, uh, this woman who's, who's my friend's wife, uh, she's actually from Florida. Uh, they live in Florida. So I'm not gonna say who it is, I'm keeping their privacy, but we have a lot of Floridians here. She basically posed as Moshe's mother sort of letting Moshe go in a basket on the river. Now, the reason this is important is because this basket is from Egypt. It's an ancient basket that was used for food, not for humans, but it was found inside a cave, inside a tomb in ancient Egypt, and it's from that time. It's from about 3,300 years ago. Um, yeah, that's about the time. So it's an incredible opportunity to, to pose when you're in Egypt, the Egyptian galleries in the Met in New York, you could sort of pose and have a lot of fun and connect to the story. So when you're going to the Met next time, you're, you're around New York, have fun, do those things. All right, that's the first part. Um, now let's go to the land of Egypt. Here we go. Okay, now I'm sharing my screen. Uh, sometimes I forget to click share, I just switched screen. So if it looks like I'm talking about something and you don't see it, just write to me in the chat and say like, hey, you didn't switch the screen or I don't see what you're talking about. Okay, and if you have any questions, either raise your hand or write to me in the chat, and I'll send you a request to unmute. It's totally fine. I, I do, I stop for questions every once in a while, uh, if there's questions, or to ask you a question and hear your answers. So here's Egypt, all right? Now, there's something really unique about the land of Egypt, and that is that it is a lush green country, as you can see, but it's in the Sahara Desert. It's in North Africa. Uh, this is the Sahara Desert. It's the largest desert in the world, basically. 
and yet south of it is is central africa is a place with monsoons with it's with constant uh, rain rain rains that are like beyond the rain that we know here they basically flood everything and we have this unique phenomena which is called the nile the yeo and the nile flows from central africa through the sahara desert into the desert so it doesn't rain in egypt egypt does not have rain so when you hear about Barad, about the, the, the plague, the Makkah of hailstones, that's like, how is that happening in Egypt? We don't, we don't have rain in Egypt. We're in the Sahara Desert. But you have water that comes from Central Africa. And this is going to be a key part of understanding ancient Egypt. Uh, and here is Israel, of course. And the area that I highlighted in green is called Eretz Goshen, the land of Goshen. And we know why that's important, right? That's where... Our, our ancestors were, our, our, the, the Hebrews, when we were slaves, when we were Avadim in Mitzrayim in Egypt, this is where we lived, and it's the closest part to Israel. Here we are, we're basically in Israel, and this is the Sinai Desert, this is Yamsuf, this is the Red Sea, or the Sea of, it's also called the Sea of Reeds, there's different translations, but this is Yamsuf, all of this. Okay, it's in the news now because the travel from uh, through Yemen, this is Yemen right now, is all the ships that are trying to come to Israel through Yemen are being are being uh, basically shot at by the Yemenites, by the Houthis. That, that's here if you if you follow world news and you know like why is the price of shipping certain things you know going through the roof in Israel? That's because it's dangerous to to ship them because they're being shot at by the Houthis here. So that's just like just so you understand why we're at, because the ships have to come here. Anyway, back to our story. So this is Egypt. Now, we're going to do some uh, connection to Hebrew, to, to Lashon HaKodesh, because in Hebrew, the word for Egypt tells us a lot about how it looks and what it is. So the first thing we need to do when talking about Mitzrayim, Egypt, is to see Egypt the way the Egyptians looked at the world. And we are apparently looking at everything upside down. So let's screw on our Egyptian hats and look at things the right way. This is how Egypt looks at the world. For Egypt, the Nile was everything. The Nile was life. The Nile was the source of their life. Without the Nile, they're dead. You can't, you're in the desert, right? So they rely 100% on the Nile for life. Now let's zoom in and you'll see that everywhere around the Nile, is green fields. Egypt is an agricultural society in ancient times, and until now, some things haven't changed. This is all fields around the Yeo, around the Nile. And the Nile and the country is very, very narrow, which brings us to part one of understanding the word Mitzrayim in Hebrew. The word Mitzrayim, what does it translate as? What does it mean? Think about that for a moment, especially if you know Hebrew. Uh, we sing this in Hallel, Mina Metzar Karatia, or if you want a different tune, Mina Metzar Karatia, Metzar. Yes, Nechama, you're raising your hand. Go ahead. I'm referring to the name on the Zoom. Go ahead. Um, the Metzar is also, it's also like the same word. It's it's the same Shorish. Right. And but what does it mean? What is Metzar? Or like ben Metzarim, what does the word Metzar come from? What is the word? Can you think of anything that's connected to that? Does anyone want to jump in? Not not to the not to the river. There's crocodiles there. I meant to the conversation. <laughs> yes, anyone? All you have to do is raise your hand, and I'll open your microphone. Uh, Gabai. Yes, I'm assuming you're not Shoshana, but uh, go ahead. And then Yehuda and Yadid after him. I sent you a request to open the microphone. You just have to, to click it. Open your mic. Okay, while you figure that out, um, Yehuda and Yadid, go ahead. Narrow. 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 Tsar. Very good. Or something that's a, uh, that one second here, you looks like you figured it out. Go ahead. Um, is that. Um, was that, um, was that, it means, um, that, um, that, like, wait, 
Are we talking about what the pasuk means or what? No, no, no. We're talking about what the word mitzar means. Oh, mitzar. Yes. Um, Okay. Is that mitzar means like, like, well, it sounds like it's short water because me is water and tsar is. Oh, mitzar. That's very, I like that. It's like narrow waters. That's very nice. I never thought of that. Thank you. Um, now, mitzar means narrow. So that I like that. That's beautiful. I'm going to use that. Now, mitzari means something that presses you from all ends. Like when we talk about when, when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came and attacked us, it's called ben ha-mitzarim, between, one, between a rock and a hard place, right? It's like you're ben ha-mitzarim. But look at the shape of the country. It's the only country whose borders you can see from outer space. It is a tsar country. It's very, very narrow. That's how it's made because the entire country in ancient Egypt was around the Nile. If you get too far from the Nile, you're dead. There's no water. There's no food. And there's wild animals. The only people who actually lived far away from the Nile are, are the pharaohs after they died, where they were buried there. That's like the, the tomb of the kings and all the valley of the kings, like this area here. Uh, called the Valley of the Kings, this is where they buried their kings and queens. But nobody lived there. You had to travel there and make sure that you have water. So that's the first thing about Egypt. Now, the second one is really cool about the name Mitzrayim. Is, first of all, remember that for Egypt, Egypt, this is called up <clears throat> because they look up to where the Nile comes from and the, Ni- and the Nile and the Nile flows north. So we look at north as up because we use this Chinese invention called a compass. But they didn't know about compasses. For them, the Nile was up. And, and the Nile flowed down, 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 down into the Yamatichon, into the Mediterranean Sea. That's where it ended. So Egypt looked at this as up. And in fact, it's higher up topographically, right? It's hills. So now look at this. In ancient Egypt, this was called Upper Egypt. And this was called Lower Egypt. And I know it's confusing because Upper is South and and Lower is North, but that's because we have our heads on backwards because we're modern. In ancient Egypt, this was Lower Egypt. But it's more interesting than that because in ancient Egypt, these, uh, excuse me, These were two separate countries. We're just talking about the Nile. I need some water. Ah, much better. These were two different countries. And we're going to talk about that in a minute soon, because before we go into the museums, I'm going to give you a, a, a weapon to, I, to, to be able to attack, not really attack, but I'm going to give you information to unlock things about Egyptian galleries in any museum in, in the world that you go to. Okay, so in Egypt, these were two different countries. And the first paro, the first pharaoh of of Egypt is the king who combined them into one country. But they still call themselves the kings of upper and lower Egypt or the rulers of two lands for for thousands of years. That's what the paros called themselves. So now think about the word in Hebrew, Mitzrayim. It's not Mitzar, it's Mitzrayim. What else ends with Yim? Right? Enaim, Oznaim, Shinaim, Yadaim, Raglaim. It means two. It's a land, it's two lands. In the word, it's both narrow, narrow waters, and it's two lands. Isn't that cool? Just by by looking at it, we suddenly understand what it means. So before we talk about museums and paros, I'd like to introduce to you one concept about the crowns of ancient Egypt. Now, in ancient Egypt, the pharaohs, the kings, had different kinds of crowns for different occasions uh, and and from what part of the country. Like, there's a lot of different kinds of crowns that you wear. There's a crown that you wear when you're sitting in the, in the throne room and people are coming to visit you. And then there's a crown that you wear when you go out to war. But like the big top hat that looks white, you're not going to run out to battle with that because it's, it's going to fly off and you're going to look silly, right? So you have to know which crown. Now, in, Egypt, in ancient Egypt, there are so many different crowns, and it looks like a mess. And the truth is that we can do a whole class just on that, but I don't want to get you all confused with this gigantic mess. What I'd like to do instead, just this is a picture showing you different uh, pictures, uh, graphics of different Egyptian crowns and different real artifacts from Egypt where you see the pharaohs wearing them. 
So you see that there's different kinds of crowns. But forget all this. I just want to talk about one crown, or rather two that became one. Um, can you read this, or is it upside down? Hmm. I wonder why it's upside down. Let's fix this. There we go. Now we're looking at Egypt like an Egyptian. The pharaohs of the ancient Egypt, before they were united into one country, they had two different crowns. If you're a crown from the south, and I'm not talking about Alabama, I'm talking about, about uh, northern Egypt, uh, sorry, upper Egypt, then you would be wearing the crown of upper Egypt, which is this white one. And it's higher up. It's easy to identify, right? If you're from lower Egypt, it's this crunchy little crown. It's called, it's a, it's a red crown, right? So it depends where you're from. Now, this is all background because, the, because once Egypt was united by one king, they created a new crown. So this is a picture for, it's, it's really a class for another time when we introduce the pharaohs themselves. That's hopefully the next class. But this is just an introduction. This is called the Narmer plate. It's in Egypt and it's a plate. We call it a plate, but you don't actually eat on it. It's a plate that was probably for mixing makeup inside that little circle between the necks of those big monsters, whatever, it's, whatever. Anyway, it has a picture of the first king of Egypt who united upper and lower Egypt. His name was Naarmer, and he's, he's, there's really some cool stuff about him, but after he united upper and lower Egypt, they created the double crown, which united upper and lower Egypt, and this is gonna be very important for us as we move along. Okay, questions, yes, go ahead. It's like those animals were elephants or something. Uh, it's it's funny what exactly are there? I mean, again, there's a whole class on this. It's basically lions, but their their neck was just stretched artistically. Kind of right? looks like elephants. It does, but it's it's lions. But th these every single picture here means something, and that's really why it's a class for another time because we could talk about this for hours. Uh, okay, uh, Schmidt, were you raising your hand? Kids there on the couch. Is King Paro in Lower Egypt? Ah, okay. Um, so. Paro is, so the first Paro is Paro who conquered Upper and Lower Egypt and turned it into one country, right? That's what we need to know. Now on our next stop, we're going to see how we see the different crowns, and then you'll see the answer to that. The question of where is Paro from? Is Paro from Upper or Lower Egypt? Like after this, where is he from? That's a very important question, and that's going to be our next stop. So without further ado, our next stop is going to be the British Museum. Um, you know what? First of all, let's jump into Egypt before we go. I thought it would be fun. So the pyramids, we all know the pyramids. Um, and I know that a lot of you might have heard or think that uh, the Jews built the pyramids, but I'm sorry to bust that myth. The pyramids were there a thousand years before the Jews ever stepped foot on this planet. Uh, they have nothing to do with us, but they're still quite amazing, but they're in the wrong place. Like I showed you where Goshen was. They're in the, in the wrong place. Yes, Rabinowitz, go ahead. Um, didn't the Jews build some of them later nope. on when they were there? Nope. Uh, I know people think that because of a movie that your parents will know, it's called The Ten Commandments by Ceci B. DeMille. You wouldn't have seen it. It's a 10 hour long movie. But in that movie, they made the Jews building it, so everybody thinks that now because of a movie. But it has nothing to do with us. Uh, but I still want you to see it because, look, here's also the Sphinx, and we'll, we'll talk about Sphinxes later. A Sphinx is a kind of uh, uh, magical creature that's half lion, half person, or half other animal, half person. Right? These are massive, massive statues that were built. However, um, I just want you to see where they are. Uh, look where Goshen is where we live, this green area, and look how far away, this is where the pyramids are. And the pyramids are basically a cemetery in the desert for, de for dead pharaohs. They have nothing to do with the cities that we built for living people. We built cities somewhere all the way here. Nothing to do with us, but it sounds like fun because hey, we built it, nothing to do with us, all right? All right, let's move on. So our next stop is the British Museum. Let's go to London. Yes, quick question. Go ahead.
Didn't the Jews be building after? We were there a thousand years after the pyramids. We built other things. We were slaves and we built other things. Okay. All kinds of other things. But let's stick. I, I would love to talk about that too. But we built we, we built cities for storage. Okay. Now we got to, I want to make sure we actually get a chance to go in. So we'll hold the questions for a little bit later. Uh, here is the British Museum. The British Museum in, uh, in London. And uh, let's jump into the Egyptian galleries. So welcome to the Egyptian galleries. Now, as we go through the Egyptian galleries in the British Museum, I'd like you to pay attention to the crowns of the pharaohs and try to see if you can tell, is this a pharaoh from upper or lower Egypt? Now you could simply uh, like lift your hands and just point down for lower and point up for upper Egypt. So what pharaoh is this, upper or lower? You say upper, you say upper. Now look at the shape, it's sort of scrunched, it's low. So this is a crown of Lower Egypt. Now let's move on to another one. These three stooges who are really grumpy because somebody broke their nose off. These are Lower Egypt. Well, that's north, but just to keep things simple, this is Lower Egypt. Now you think you've seen them all, but then suddenly you have this guy, and look at that. Ha, huh. there you go, that's correct. This is a crown of Upper Egypt, and on his chest is carved his name, so you know which which Paro this is. So this Paro was probably ruling in or born in Upper Egypt, but then he ruled over all of Egypt, right? But they would make the crown based on where he's from, which is a very big deal in ancient Egypt. And now we have this interesting guy right here. Look at his crown. What crown is this, upper or lower? Hmm. So if both answers are correct, what would you say this is? This is a double crown, very good. This is a double crown, the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. And this guy, by the way, if you've heard of King Tut, this is a statue of his great grandfather. That's another story. Um, now, uh, so this is him. Now I'd like you to take a look at the next thing. Uh, take a look at the arm from the statue. This is an incredibly large arm. Um, this is an incredibly large arm, and it's part of a very large statue that shows Paro with an outstretched arm. Now, Paro with an outstretched arm, how would I say outstretched arm in Hebrew? Think of that, I'm sure you've, you're familiar with the expression. It is, and I'm gonna switch uh, back to our slides. Here we are. When we let me explain. When we read the Haggadah, this is the quote from the Haggadah. It's in Hebrew, but I'll, I'll say it in English. We were slaves to Paro in Egypt. God, our Lord, took us out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Now, this is a very interesting expression because it's the only time in all of Tanakh that we ever use it in reference to ancient Egypt, because the Egyptians used this to talk about their kings. So if you wanna kind of laugh at Paro and say like, ha ha, you think you're the big boss, let me show you. And we use the same language that the pharaohs used to describe themselves. And they made these huge statues with outstretched arms like this, uh, to show how strong and how grand they are. That is the, a very important thing, okay? So now, uh, we're gonna continue, we're gonna talk more about Egypt and, and archeology span and the Haggadah, but first I'd like to take you to the key to telling us all of this. How do we know all these things about ancient Egypt? And this is the key. Does anybody know what we're looking at? You talked about it in the first Zoom about Purim. It's a stone with three language. It's called the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone. Okay, very good. Three languages. Good. Does anybody want to add anything about it? Is it some sort of like stone with writing on it? Yes. Um, Let's tell the story of the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone. It looks like there says something on it. It writing does. 
Yeah, it does. And in the in the in the comments below, I'll send you a link to a 3D scanning of it where you could flip it around, turn it around, and zoom in and out. But look at this. Uh, there's writing here in three it's different like scripts. Yeah. So now now listen carefully, because this is an introduction, even though we're we're only touching on it a little bit. This was actually discovered by Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon. He when his soldiers conquered Egypt about 200 years ago, they found this. And then the British kicked them out of Egypt, and then the British took it. And that's why it's in the British Museum. And both want it back. Uh, the, the Egyptians want it back, and the, the, the French want it back. But anyway, so here's the basic story. This is a stone. It's a royal decree written in Greek right here. This is all Greek by a, a, one of the descendants of, of uh, Alexander the Great's generals. His name was Talmai. Ptolemy. You might know his name. I'm not getting into it right now. Ptolemy V. And this is when the Greeks ruled Egypt. But they wrote only, not only in Greek, they also wrote in Egyptian that everybody could read. Um, now, unfortunately for the Egyptians, only the priests who were very well educated, who went to school for many, many years, right, to learn how to do hieroglyphics. It's very difficult to read. Um, Many people didn't know how to do, read that. So this is hieroglyphics, and it's broken. There's a whole top to it. Um, but because normal people couldn't read hieroglyphics, but you have to write it because you're in Egypt. It has to look official. Um, so they wrote in Demotic, which is like a handwritten script kind of thing. That's the one in the middle. Now, um, long story short, 150 years ago, a French, a French Egyptologist whose name sounds like shampoo, it's Champollion, it's like Napoleon with shampoo, Champollion figured out how to read it. And since then, we know everything that we know about Egyptian mythology and the gods and the stories and all these pharaohs and stuff. So that means that you have an advantage over your great great grandparents who 150 years ago, 200 years ago, were learning the Haggadah, we're learning the Chumash, we're learning the story. They didn't know the things that you could know about Paro, Egypt, and, and the mythology, because it's been forgotten for thousands of years. Okay, uh, I see we have questions. Let me just erase the board. And uh, yes, go ahead, who, a couple of questions. Keep it quick because we're on a schedule, okay? Go ahead. Yes, our Florida base, Rabinowitz, go ahead. Okay. Um, yes? She just wants to ask something. What, Naomi? What, what, what do you want to ask? You want to I had a question. Oh. Um, didn't they, like, didn't, did he teach what, what other people that language or something? Who, who is he? The person you were talking about. The king who wrote it? Yeah. No, no, everybody knew it at the time. Back then, 2,100 years ago, everybody knew it. There in Egypt, right? But then it was forgotten. After the Romans, it was forgotten, okay? All right, let's move on. So uh, our next stop, uh, we, we, have, we have to meet another very important pharaoh, and then we'll talk about the name pharaoh. This paro here was right next to the Rosetta Stone. There, there it is, right? This paro, what crown is this, upper or lower? It's a trick question. Ah, very good. I see some already already caught on to it. Very good. Take a close look. We're going to move to the side and look at that. Very good. Very good. Right. Because on top of his crown of Lower Egypt is a broken crown because the statue broke. But it looks like it looks like a cake that's surrounded by cobra snakes with suns on their heads. Right. So it's a double crown. It's a crown of Upper and Lower Egypt together. Now, this is a very important pharaoh. His name is Ramses, Ramses the Great. I'm sure you've heard his name because some people think, some people think, but we don't really know, that this is the power of Itziat Mitzrayim of the Exodus, but we don't know 100%. He could be 200 years too late. Uh, it's a very fun story, but he's in the movie Prince of Egypt. That's Ramses the Great. And speaking of Ramses, there's a ram, but we'll get to that ram later. Okay. So now let's talk about something really cool that we know because of the Rosetta Stone. What does the name Paro actually mean? Paro, para'a. 
per means house, and para ah means a house that makes you go ah. It's a great house. Now that's what you call the king, right? It's the name that all the kings were called paro. So it could be paro Ramses, paro Necho, paro Tchutmos, paro Chopra, paro Shara. Paro was the name of all of the kings, but it's not his actual name. It's his title because he is the ruler of the great castle, the house, the government, the, the White House, the Knesset, the Kremlin, whatever you want to call it. He's the big boss, the big cheese. So his name is Great House and then whatever his name is. Now, I want to show you one really cool thing, which you know this, and then you open the Chumash, you open the Torah, you open the story, and you read the following, and I'll explain it. It suddenly means something different. So we're talking about Shifra and Pua. Shifra and Pua, the, the, maid, the, the nursemaids who defied, who didn't listen to Paro, and they let the, the children live. So I'm, I'm assuming you all know the story uh, more or less. But God gave them a, a reward, a sechar. They didn't do as the king of Egypt commanded them. They let the kids live. And as a result of that, because they feared the Lord, God gave them houses. Now, what does it mean that he gave them houses? It sounds like, okay, so they were able to build a, a nice beach house uh, somewhere in like on Miami Beach or something. Like, what does it mean he gave them houses? Right? What does it mean? So Rashi, our commentary and Chazal, our tradition is that he basically blessed them with batei kiwana, batei livia, like houses of malchut. Like, you will have kings or koanim, priests that will come from your descendants. Right? And that's like a house, like a dynasty. Okay, that's very nice, but what does it have anything to do with what they did? So listen to this. It's really cool because there's a concept that's called mida keneged mida. Mida keneged mida, mida keneged mida, measure for measure, where I'll, I'll take questions in just a moment, okay? Please, a little bit of patience. Let me just finish this point, okay? Um, where God basically repays you in the same way that you acted. So they stood up to the great house, and God gives them a great house of their own. Kings, Kohanim, Levi'im, he's repaying them in kind. That's one of the advantages of once we can read hieroglyphics, we understand Mida Keneged Mida. We understand that God's giving them uh, a, a reward in the same way that, uh, that they acted. Okay, questions now? Thank you for your patience. Let's start with, uh, here, uh, Gabai. And then we'll go to Yedid. Go ahead. Um. How did the Egyptians um make um have make like the blue marks next to the eyes? Was uh, they it had, makeup or like, yes, they used they makeup. Make yes, they used so makeup. How did they make it? Oh, they how would they crush. They would crush different plants in uh, with powder with natural materials. I'm not an expert on this, but I just know that in Hebrew, the word for the makeup is the same word for the color blue. Uh, and the same word for paintbrush. The word for blue is kachol. A paintbrush is a mikhol, which means something that puts on kachol, and it's called kachal. Uh, it's called kol in English as well, kol. But that's the Hebrew kachal, that's because that's the color of the eyeliner that the Egyptians used as makeup. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Use like, a, use like a. Yeah, sorry, I just had to. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yehuda, you did. Go ahead. Um. Paro sounds like para. It sounds like? Para. Like cow? Like yeah. para aduma? Yeah. I'm not, okay. Um, so, I mean, we could say a lot of things about paro, but once we know what it means in ancient Egyptian, that just adds another level to how we understand the story. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes, go ahead, Rabinowitz. Last question before we move on, okay? How do they know all the stuff that from like years and years ago? Because we because of the Rosetta Stone. 
Because 150 years ago, well, listen, the whole story is a really, really cool story, which we could go into in the next class when we talk about Paro and his connection to the Nile um, and Egypt. And like, that's a time we can talk about it. Right now, it's just enough to say that we figured out how to read it 150 years ago. And since then, so they figured it out. So now they go and read everything that they found. And they found tons and tons of stuff. So you keep on reading it, and then over time, you figure it out. So like, for example, right behind us is, um, where is it? Let's see if I could find it. Um, here it is. This stone that was then turned into a grindstone, and they cut holes into it. One second. See, this is spontaneous. You ask a question, and then you learn something new. This stone over here in hieroglyphics has one of the most famous Egyptian creation myths. There are stories about how the world was, was created. It's on this stone, which is ruined, because then some Roman later said, let's turn this into a grindstone. I can't read, or maybe, I don't know who did it. Somebody did it later. Uh, I'm just saying like, so we started reading all these things, and then we learn all about Egypt. Okay? Yes, Schmidt and uh, Noah, and then uh, Schmitz. Go ahead. Um, how do they know... Um... What what um statue it is? How do they know what power it is? That's a good question. All the statues were made to look the same, except they would carve on them a different name. And we know how to read the names. Okay? Okay, okay yes, Schmidt, go ahead. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Um speak up. What how many statues are in this museum? Um, wow, that's such a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I would say more than 200, but I don't know. I was there, so I can tell you more than 200, but I don't know how many. And they have a lot that they don't show because they don't have room for everything. It's one of the biggest museums in the whole world. Okay, Yehuda, Yadid, were you raising your hand? Go ahead. Just open your mic. What? How did they, like find like everything like there everything. well they they so over many years different uh mu different museums and different universities would work together with the egyptian government and they would go and dig so they can find these things and then put them in a museum so we can learn about them if you leave them where you find them they'll get stolen or ruined uh so that's the short answer to your question okay there's a longer answer but that's the short answer What's the stone in the middle, and why is it empty? Uh, it's it's uh, it's a tomb for a mummy, which is a dead person, and the reason it's empty is because he got up and walked around. We might he might come back later. I'm just kidding. It's because the tomb was robbed, and they just emptied it and took everything, like thieves years ago before it was found. These are all these are all where they buried the mummies inside these things. So if they buried somebody and by mistake they were alive, they'd be stuck inside because it's way too heavy. That would never happen. Did anyone like, why would they rob it? Because they buried treasures. And they wanted to find the treasures. And this happened many, many times. Many times. Okay? All right. So we now have, let's say, another 15 minutes more or less. So I'd like to take you now to a different part of the story to talk about the 10 plagues, the 10 makot. Um, we're going to talk about them with a bit of an introduction first to Egyptian mythology. Okay, and then I'm going to introduce you to my favorite Haggadah. You might have a different one. I want you to be familiar with the one that's my favorite Haggadah. Okay, so Egyptian mythology and the 10 plagues. First of all, what is mythology? Uh, and do we believe that it's real? No, we don't believe it's real. Uh, I don't even know how many of the Egyptians really believed it was real all the time, but it's a way that they explained the world that made sense before science. So it made sense to them that there's like a Nile god that controls the Nile and that there's animals that rip, that are like the force of nature that the gods speak to us through that. That's kind of what they believed. And then they started creating all kinds of things around it. So it's not like theories because theories are a lot stronger. Like the theory of gravity is more powerful than a fact. Like, you know, it works, it's real. If it wouldn't work, we couldn't fly spaceships. We couldn't fly airplanes. So the theory of gravity has thousands or millions of facts and the theory explains the facts. But the Egyptians didn't have science. So they couldn't really, they just tried to understand nature. 
and and they just figured it out. So I was responding to a private question. Somebody asked me, "Is is mythology like theories?" Not really. It's it's a lot weaker than theories, and every country had their own different mythologies. Okay. Now, why do we care? Why should me, a Jewish person living in Israel or wherever, care about Egyptian mythology? And it's a simple answer, because when we talk about the ten plagues, the ten makot, the ten makos, then like if we understand what the Egyptians believed, we will understand what God's message to the Egyptians is much better. If we don't understand, it was like, okay, God is great. He does miracles, but why frogs? It's such a bizarre thing. Like God wants to show that he created the world by flooding Egypt with frogs. Why? why, why? It's so weird, right? It's like the weirdest thing. But when you understand Egyptian mythology, the 10 plagues suddenly mean something different. So we're not going to do every single one of the plagues, but we're going to do some of the plagues. And then I'll take you back to the museum and we're going to wrap it up with a little surprise, which has to do with Pesach. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I want to introduce you to my favorite Haggadah. It's called Baba. Uh, some of you might know it, but it's kind of an Israeli comic book character. So if you're not in Israel, there's a chance you don't know it. Baba is a character who lived 1,800 years ago. He's not real, but he's, he lives in the time of the Mishnah, uh, the Roman period in Israel. And Shai Charke was an Israeli caricaturist. He's very famous in Israel. He makes a lot of kids' books and, and comics and, and, and Muppet shows, like the Israeli politic Muppet shows from the – whatever. He did a lot of stuff. And, and he made this beautiful Haggadah with this character that we all know, but he made Baba the Haggadah. And it's my favorite Haggadah. I still use it, even though, yeah, you look at me, I'm an adult, right? But don't tell anyone. No, so I love the Haggadah. So he has this piece about the 10 plagues, the 10 makot, and here it is. So here he is, but dam tzfardeh kinim, so the plague of blood, frogs, and then there's a little louse going, yoo -hoo, and he's trying to slam it, and he's hitting himself. Arov, so he's running away from wild animals. Deva, which is probably pestilence or rats, different explanations. And then you have shechin, barad, so you have boils, we have... Uh, I so ploop, look, my ice tea, but then bonk on his head. And look at Arbe, look at locusts. They come, vroom, and then they go, vroom, and they just eat everything. Darkness, and the darkness says, it's so dark that I can't even see myself. But if there's a thought bubble here, that means that I can think. And if I think, therefore I am. Or as the philosopher says, cogito ergo som. But you have to get that joke. Um, and then makat bechorot, so the whole newspaper is full of weeping eyes. So this is from this Haggadah. Now, um, I see there's questions. Um, uh, can, uh, it's gonna wait for a little bit, okay? So I wanna just do an overview and then we'll talk about a few of them and we'll talk about the actual mythology. But let's first of all, look at it this way. In ancient Egypt, the Egyptian world was built around the Nile. Everything is the Yeo, everything is the Nile, okay? Um, and basically, um, all of their ideas about the world were connected in one way or another to the Oyo, to the Nile, because that's their life, okay? So what happens is the, the 10 Makot have to, gra to slowly, slowly teach the Egyptians that their gods don't really control the Nile. And you can only teach them one tiny lesson at a time. You can't go all in and say all of your gods are nothing, because then they're like, so what do I do? What do I do? How do I understand? It, it's too much, it's too much to handle. So you have to go slowly, slowly. So you start with the Nile, with the water, with the things that live in it, small land animals, and then you slowly, slowly, slowly move up to bigger things. So bigger animals, wild animals, the life of the animals, are they sick, are they healthy? You know, Who really controls that? And then you slowly move to humans and then to the sky, light and dark, and finally life and death itself. So. I hope you don't get freaked out by this cute little uh, zombie. He likes the lo he likes lollipops. His name is George, and uh, and this is how it goes. Okay, so we're going to start with the Nile, where you basically attack the Nile god and how they look at the world through the Nile. Uh, now we have a question. The Schmitz, thank you for waiting patiently. Go ahead. Why why are there a few people wearing um, we have in, um, Egyptian crowns. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you um, asked the I question. Because I thought there's only one Paro. Right. I'm glad you asked the question. So here's where it's going to get really fun. Um, I use AI. I use artificial intelligence 
to um, to make pictures for my tours. And sometimes it just does really weird and funny things, and it's fun to figure them out. Then you see, like, he's wearing glasses, and he, they basically use Dumbledore from one of the movies. That's like, he just found a picture instead of Moshe. So it does a lot of weird, funny things, and this is what mm. you got. It made weirder ones that are so weird I can't use them. I kept the ones that are the least weird, but it's fun to look at them. So look for the fun stuff. Okay. Uh, I know you're not Zelda. That's your mom, but go ahead. Um, why is one part of the water, like, red and the other blue? Like... Oh, because the water is the first plague. The first maka of, is the the plague of blood, maka dam, and that's where the water was turned into blood, but it happens slowly. It's like it spreads out and spreads out and spreads out, and all the water turns red. So that's the story. Why is, like, behind that guy that's up on the rock, like yes. a lion face or something. So there's a lot of weird, funny stuff that, that AI does when you, when it makes pictures. And you'll see weirder stuff later. It's just how it made it. And you know what? It would take forever to fix it. I'm just going to keep it. Okay. Hold your questions because we need to move on a little bit more. But I'll stop for questions in just a little bit. So which God is related to the Nile? Well, there's a lot of answers to that. We have to have a whole class just about that because there's like 10 different Nile gods and each one has to do with a different animal or, or idea. But the one I want you to think about is this little character whose name is Happy, Happy. And um, if you're thinking this, uh, yes, I got the joke. I thought about it too, but no, it's this is it. Okay, it's not, he's not Happy. It's called Happy. Now, Happy is a picture of two people tying together Upper and Lower Egypt to unite Egypt. Because the Nile is what unites Upper and Lower Egypt. So the Nile god, Hapi, represents the unification, the combination, the connection of both Upper and Lower Egypt. So it's not Mr. Happy like this, but it's this. And we find it in, in seals like this, like this is a ring of one of the pharaohs, or, or thrones. This is a very famous uh, picture which even shows up on Egyptian money, but that's a story for another time. So the Nile. Now in the Nile, we ha now have the funny, funny plague, Makats Fardea, the plague of frogs. Now froggies, what the heck is the idea of froggies? Well, I mean, you could show that you control the Nile and all that lives inside it, and that's, that's important. So you can't, you, Paro, or your magicians don't really control the Nile. Right now, look carefully at this picture. You'll see some really bizarre stuff happening, like a frog with two feet running in the air, and lots of other weird things happening here. But it's funny, right? So, uh, there's some frogs here where the eyes are in the wrong place. It's really fun to look at. Questions I want to introduce you to the frog. You see, there's always a picture of the Egyptian god or goddess, as we say, Avodah Zara, really. Like, it's not, it's not real, it's idolatry. But there's a picture on the bottom right, and this is the one of the goddesses of the Nile called Heket, which kind of sounds like like cricket, cricket, Heket, Heket. Heket is the frogess, and she's the wife of Chnum. Who is Chnum? Well, the Schmitz asked the question that has to do with sheep. That's all I'm going to say now. It has something to do with sheep. We'll find out very soon. Heket is a Nile goddess. So it has to do with fertility, with the creation of life and life in the Nile. Um, and we're attacking that, okay? We're attacking that. Wasn't there like a big frog that spat out all the little frogs? Ah, the the question. Uh, that's a question that shows up in Rashi. Um, uh, for those for those who aren't familiar, I'll just refresh everyone's memory. The word in the Torah it says vataalat tzefardeh, and the frog rose out of the Nile. Now, what does that mean? It could mean the big frog rose out of the Nile, or it's simply like saying there's millions of frogs and they just came out. There's two different ways. So if you go to that Rashi, everyone notices the first part, which is amazing. And they don't read the second part where he says, well, in simple Hebrew, you could also just call many frogs frog, like saying fishes, fish, or sheeps, sheep. It's just a way of speaking. So I'm familiar with that. You should even know that the Abrabanel, who actually was lived in Spain, but he knew about Egypt at the time, uh, he knew that crocodiles were like small little pests, like tiny crocodiles were like caused you a lot of problems if you're a farmer on the Nile. So he said, maybe it's crocodiles. 
Now, he didn't know hieroglyphics, but he knew enough about Egypt to guess that if there's tiny little animals that are getting into everything, maybe it's crocodiles. Who knows if Tzfardea is actually frog or not? That was, I don't think he's right, but it's really interesting that he said that. Okay, last stop before our, our, final, our final stop, and that is um, wild animals, Arov. Now, this is where it gets fun, because if you look at different Haggadahs, some of them have like octopi coming out of places and animals that came from who knows where, right? I think it makes the most sense to say that the, the wild animals in Egypt were the wild animals that live in Egypt, except they started attacking people. I think that makes the most sense, but I'm not going into that. I want to introduce to you one creature from Egyptian mythology the boogeyman, the monster in the closet, the scary nightmare creature that lives in ancient Egypt, and that is Amut the Devourer. Um, so I want to introduce this little creature, and here it is. Now, who is this monster? What is it? I want to show you what it is. Give me just a second. I'm going to jump back to the museum. I didn't forget the sheep. We're going to go back to the sheep. I want to show you something that was buried with the mummies. So we're going to jump upstairs to the next floor really quickly. We're almost finished. And this second floor has mummies. Now, I'm not going to show you the real mummies here on the side because it's kind of gross and some people don't want to see it. But these are covered up. But there's real mummies in here. Um, and these mummies are basically dead people who were wrapped up to save their bodies so they could kind of live forever. And then they would cover them in gold and jewelry and bury them with all of their stuff. Now, after they bury them with all of their stuff, see, you see all these statues and jewelry and look at that gold covered, like amazing, right? Um, they also buried their pets. So here's like uh, mummy pets. Here's a cat. There's actually a cat in there. Uh, there's a mummy crocodile, that long thing. And they buried also uh, other things like here's a bird this uh, ibis bird here. They buried these birds or they buried hawks. So they buried animals, like they buried people's pets. They buried everything that they could and treasures, which is why people always try to rob their treasures. But they also buried these instructions explaining to the person who's dead what they need to do to get to the afterlife. And that's where we have these pieces of papyrus, which are called the Book of the Dead. It's an instruction manual for the soul. And in it, you'll see that here is this little monster. Uh, I'm going to draw a picture of him just so you see him. Here he is. That is Amut the Devourer. And I'd like to tell you a really interesting and funny tale about him. Uh, he's on all of these. He's everywhere. right? He's all over the place. What is he? Who is he? Why is he important to the Ten Plagues? Uh, I have a question for you, Daniel. Did guess? Go ahead. It's 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 like a crocodile with a goat. It's all kinds of animals together. Ah, yeah, so, that's what I wanted to say. So can you tell, other than a crocodile, I'm asking everybody, what other animals do you see here? A donkey. It's, a it's donkey. a bear, okay. a lion, a crocodile. A lion. Okay, yes. A tiger. tiger. Tiger, okay. And uh, a beaver. I'll show you. Oh, a beaver? <laughs> Interesting. Beaver. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, yes. I kind it of looks like um, a calf human or something. Because it has okay. So the three most deadly um, animals in Egypt. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think um, it's like um, it's a crocodile. Um, a uh, a lion and a horse. Um, You're so and with close. A Pavo, and with a Pavo's crown. You're so close. It's actually a mane, but I like the guess. Now, there's a certain kind of horse, at least in Hebrew, that lives in the Nile. It's called in Hebrew sus yeo. Or I'll just say it in Latin, hippopotamus, which means a Nile horse. Hippopotamus means susio, Nile horse. These are the animals. Now, 
When I say that it is the three or a combination of the most dangerous animals in ancient Egypt, this is the nightmare monster that in the Egyptian mythology, if you're not a righteous person, you're not a tzaddik, after you die, he's going to eat up your heart and that's it. You'll never make it to the afterlife. He's called Amut, the devourer of souls. Now he's part hippo, that's the back. He's part crocodile and in the middle... It depends. Sometimes he's a lion. Sometimes he's maybe a cheetah or something. So look at two examples. Here's one, Book of the Dead. And here he's a lion. And they're, they're, weighing, they're weighing the person's heart. We're not talking about that today. And here he is uh, like a cheetah or something. Right? So you see he's either or. Right? So he's a combination. Now what does all of this mean? I'm just going to wrap up this point. Is that it could be that... This, if this was that kind of miracle where there's like some kind of new creature that comes out and attacks all the Egyptians, just imagine if you're an Egyptian and this is the nightmare monster, the devourer of souls, and suddenly, oh my God, it's real, and it starts chasing you. Just imagine how the Egyptians would react to that, right? It's like something out of nightmares. Suddenly that thing comes alive. It's alive. So think about, that's one explanation that I heard, and that's because the word arov, the word for the, the plague of wild animals is arov. And arov means mixture. It's a mixture of different animals. So it can mean lots of different animals coming together or an animal that is mixed up from other animals. It can mean either or. That's a cool, just the meaning of it. Now, we have our final stop, and, um, and then I'm, going, I'm just going to take uh, a couple of questions. And then we're going to go to our final stop. Um, who's there? Goodbye and you then you did. Go ahead. Why in the museum the pictures of that yeah. animal? Why were they facing back their heads? Um, I don't know. Depends on the statue, where it's looking. The Egyptians also didn't know how to draw 3D. So you always have to be looking to the sides. But if they're looking forward, they didn't. They did it, but they didn't do, do it so well. The statues, yes. I don't know. No, but they, you showed two pictures, and one of them are looking in front, and one of them was their head was completely turned around. Oh, I don't know. Maybe like he made him a little bit too close to that scale, so he had to turn his head around because there's no room. I don't know. I don't. I don't think it means anything too important. But good, 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 good eye, good eye. Yes, uh, goodbye, and then Rabinowitz. Um, I had something. Um, that I love wasn't like wild animals, but it, um, but it was more, um, but it was not wild animals. But it was like creepy crawlies and like all these okay. bugs and like poisonous bugs, bees, yeah. and all these like poison. This like thing something out of Indiana, them. like something out of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. But most of you, thankfully, have not seen that movie. Uh, I don't think it's. I'm just mentioning something so that the parents would would recognize that. Last one, please, uh, Rabinowitz. Last one. Um. Why would they want to bury their animal? Um. So that they could stay with them for the afterlife. They believe that everything that you bury and save with the, with the person would 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 join them. So you want your pets to be with you, right? Really quickly, Nechama Noah, make it quick. Go ahead. Why, why did they take the mummies out of the tombs? Uh, well, we don't really want to, but if we don't, somebody else will, and they're going to damage them. So we do it to protect them and also to study them so we can learn about them. You can scan them and learn about their teeth and their bones and what they ate, like a lot of different things. It's a story for another time, but it's an important question. Okay. All right, let's do our last thing for today, the Passover lamb, Korban Pesach, because you asked me, the Schmitz, you asked me about the sheep. So this is a very important one. Now, we have so many different things that we could do. I'm just going to do this one thing about sheep. Which one of the Egyptian gods is related to sheep? Now, just to put everyone on the same page, I want you to remember that right before the 10th plague of the dead of the firstborn, Makat Bechorot, Makas Bechoros, uh, we were commanded to take the sheep and to tie it to the bed. And we call that Shabbat HaGadol. We still talk about that until today. Like basically a few days before and to prepare. And then we're going to shecht, we're going to slaughter, like we're going to eat the sheep, 
right? And we're going to eat it in our houses doing the first Pesach, the first Passover, when God passed over our houses while the Egyptians were being uh, attacked, right? So that's called Passover Pesach. So Hashem had to, God had to protect us because the Egyptians were, were, were furious that we are sacrificing, that we're eating something that represents their God. So which Egyptian God has something to do with sheep? Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, I have a couple of hands up. Okay, go ahead, Yadid. What are these bowls next to the man? Um, baskets, sheep, I don't know. Listen, the, the three other pictures that AI made are so weird, I can't even show them. Uh, and you'll see some other funny ones as well. Okay? Um, but Okay? But anyway, it's like, I don't know, stuff around the house. I didn't tell it. I just told it to make the people tying a sheep to the bed in ancient Egypt. Everything else it made up. So it does funny things. Okay, go ahead, Rabinowitz, and then we'll, 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 we'll wrap up. It's not about that. It's because I thought that they, um, they were also commanded to um, paint the doorpost. That, that as well, that's from the blood of the animal, but that's when it's happening, right? There when we're eating the lamb. What? Wasn't there the death angel, not Hashem? It says, Ani velo malach, ani velo saraf. I myself am taking care about, of it. Right, that's what we say in the Haggadah. But anyway, let's let's put that aside for a moment. Um, but it says, I will go through Egypt on that night. Now, God says that. It says it in the Torah. Okay, so now hold on tight because we're going to wrap up here. And after that, of course, you can ask questions. I just don't want to keep people for too long because if you have to go, we're already a little bit over time. Um, so the sheep is our final stop for today. And look at that. There is a sphinx of a ram, of a sheep, who is like half sheep, half lion. And underneath him is a small pharaoh that he's protecting. Now, this is a very important Egyptian god, and I want to show you just how important he is. So our last stop is going to be in Egypt, and I want to show you one of the most important uh, temples in ancient Egypt in Luxor. It's called the, the precinct of Amun-Ra. Well, it's, in, it's the temple of Luxor. So here it is. Let it load. We're on the Nile. And we're overlooking, uh, on the other side of the Nile is the Valley of the Kings. This is where they found King Tut, uh, if you're familiar. So we are now looking at the largest temple in ancient Egypt. It was up for hundreds of years, and many pharaohs, many paros added on to it more parts. This thing is gigantic. Okay, I'll just show you a random spot, and then I'll show you our final point. Here, I just picked a random spot. The Temple of Luxor, look at the size of this thing. And this is what's left of it today. Imagine when it was actually built. There's another statue of a pharaoh. What crown is he wearing? There you go, the double crown, right? But now look at the size of that thing. It's like 10 people, it's bigger than Hagrid. Look at that thing, and there's more. Here's another one. Right? And now it's not just a statue. It's like, oh, this is a powerful pharaoh, a power of Upper and Lower Egypt. Now, one of the most important areas in this area is has to do with sheep. And here it is. You're going into the precinct of Amun-Ra. Here it is. Look at these. These are all sheep, except most of them don't look as good as the one in the museum. All of these are rams. All of these are sheep. Now, who is this? I'm going to wrap up with, with this point. Um, so this is uh, as following. There are two sheep gods. Here they are. One of them is the husband of Cheket, the frog goddess. He has to do with the Nile and life, and his name is Chnum, and he is a ram. But the most important one, which has to do with the ram, and that's where we just were in Egypt, is Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra is the most important god of ancient Egypt. He's the big one. And that's the one that we were eating on, on Pesach. You can imagine that the Egyptians were really, really, really upset because he's the big boss, the big cheese, and we were eating him, uh, well, without cheese. So this is just a little bit of, of a taste of how when we, when we learn about ancient Egypt, um, with, when, we learn, when we learn about Pesach and the Makot and the Haggadah with ancient Egypt, 
suddenly it just means something completely different. And it adds so much to the story. And I hope that we can do this again, because uh, there's at least two more lessons that we can do just about this. So thank you very much for watching Egyptian mythology and the Exodus. And uh, everybody who's watching the recording, thank you for as much for much as well. Check out the information below in the video. And now I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to take questions for the people who are with us live.